Yes, my friend. Yes, I am ready. Say what you must. I know. I think I have suspected for a while now. I just could not face it. I am sorry. I have misled you. And myself. Our time together began with a lie. I am glad it is ending with the truth. I will bother you no longer. For what it is worth, thank you. We had some fun times, you and I. Goodbye. There is nothing to talk about. Langley was right. I am crazy. My mind is broken. I have been living a lie. And worse, I have drawn you into it also. I am not worthy of your time. What? Did you call me? Do you really mean it? I will not hold it against you, if you do not. Thank you. That means more than you know. I honestly thought we had a past together, but as time went by, I did begin to doubt myself. You are so similar to the person I once knew. You even smell the same, in a good way. I think deep down I knew my old friend was dead. When I heard about you, wishful thinking became hope. Then hope became need. I needed to believe forgiveness was possible. And if not forgiveness, redemption in death. I deceived myself. It was selfish of me. Yes, agreed. Thank you, my friend. I still have much to live for because of you. I am still in your debt. You gave me a reason to go on. You made me face my past and now you are helping me come to terms with what I have done. I will follow you to oblivion and back if need be. I did not mean to lie to you. Or myself. I am ashamed. I hope in time. I will be able to earn your forgiveness. In the end, I hope our friendship and future adventures will prove more important than how we met. We are a fantastic team, you and I. You are very kind. It is a beautiful gesture. But my debt to you stands. I have not come near to earning your forgiveness yet. I wish it were that simple. Alas, it is not. I am happy you do not hold my confusion about our past against me, but I cannot say the same. Also, the person I thought you were is dead because of me. Yet another casualty of my former life. I will know when I am ready to move on, but for now, the guilt I bear still weighs down my heart. Maybe that guilt will be there for the rest of my life. I have a feeling that I am the only one who can let it go. You calling me friend means the world to me. I am honored. You have given me a reason to go on. A whole new life. A chance at happiness. If all goes well, maybe one day I will be at peace with who I am. If that happens, it will be because of you also. You cannot remove my guilt, but you have given me hope. I must do the rest. You are more understanding than most, my friend. Your words lighten my soul. But as far as my heart is concerned, I still have much to repay. Yes, I believe it will. I must continue to readdress my life's balance. I can feel a shift already. You know, we have had a few adventures, my friend. But I will never forget one particular fight. We surprised a group of filthy bandits in their smelly camp. They all stank of drink, body odor, and ugly thoughts. I had been in my cell for quite a while, and it was more excitement than I was used to. As we fought side by side, 
I became aware that a new positive force was at work in my life. Despite the unsavory nature of our foes and the sour smell of their pea-stained clothes, I knew that I would always remember that moment fondly. We were magnificent together. When the battle was done and we stood victorious, I knew I was walking a better path. Thank you for helping me unlock my potential and for giving my heart and soul a second chance. What is on your mind? I was wondering, what do you think of Skyrim's spiders? I find them very satisfying. They are enjoyable, dangerous, and amusing. We all have our hobbies, my friend. What is wrong with a little spider slaying? Do you not enjoy the noises they make when you hit them? I understand. Send any spiders that you do not want to deal with my way. I will take care of them. With pleasure. Anyway, I just wanted to make it clear that I am always ready for some spider smashing. Good. Did you want to talk about something else? That is quite a lengthy tale. Are you sure you want to hear it? It happened not long after I got my scars. I stopped off in Windhelm on my way to Riften. I arrived weary, bloody, and fragrant. All I wanted was a hot meal and a room for the night, but it was not to be. As soon as I entered the city, I felt the weight of distrustful eyes upon me. I was too tired to care. I made my way to Candleheart Hall and tried to purchase a room. I was told in no uncertain terms that I was not welcome and that I should seek shelter elsewhere. While I was explaining that I had gold and would cause no trouble, I noticed three brawny men watching me with interest. I turned from the innkeep and faced the men. You fellows see something strange? I asked. No, friend, replied the nearest. We see a man who needs a bed and a bath, but we fear you won't find them here. If you have coin, maybe we can help you. I was not sure I trusted them either, but at that moment, I decided to give them the benefit of the doubt. Anyway, I told the men I would happily part with a few coins for a room. They said they were brothers, and for 15 septims, I would be a guest in their home that night. They told me that their mother would be happy to set another place at their table. I did not have many options, so I agreed. The men took me to a deserted alleyway and motioned for me to stop. The youngest brother turned to me and said, Before we continue, we must have your word that you will keep what we are about to show you to yourself. No problem, I replied. He nodded, then felt along the stone wall, paused, then knocked four times. There was a grinding noise, and a large section slid back to reveal a torch-lit passageway. Who are you people? I asked as we entered the gap in the wall. Do not be alarmed, said the eldest brother. Hot food and a warm bed are waiting up ahead. We pressed on, and the entrance closed behind us. It was relatively warm. Water dripped from the stony ceiling and I could smell magic in the air. We soon came to a heavy wooden door. The youngest brother stepped forward and again knocked four times. I heard a key turn on the other side. A grunt. The door opened and I was face to face with the oldest woman I have ever seen. We have a guest, dear mother, said the eldest brother. Well, come in then. Table set. Go wash your hands. You weren't followed, were you? No, no, he replied, pushing past her. Come in, friend. You're safe, and soon you'll be fed. I stepped inside. I was in a huge stone room full of all manner of useless junk and trinkets. There were no windows, and it was very dim, but I could make out a row of beds against a far wall near a large open fire. The old woman looked up at me. Got money? She held out a gnarled hand. Of course, I said, handing it over. 
Thank you for letting me rest here. What is your name? Everyone just calls me mother, she said. You can do the same if you like. Makes no difference to me. She motioned for me to sit at a long table where the other men were already eating greedily. I sat and tucked in. There was soup and roast beef and vegetables, and I ate until I thought I was going to rupture. When we were done, I was taken to a corner sectioned off by hanging furs. Inside, there was a steaming bath. I sank into it, felt my poor muscles relax and shut my eyes. I drifted off. You are very suspicious, my friend. Maybe that is why you are still alive. Yes, there was something in my food. I had some very strange dreams. I saw the brothers caper and dance and fly about the room. I saw Fergus in a pool of blood staring up at me, mouthing the words, Run, Inigo! Run! I saw a vast glass cage with a rough and scored ceiling. I saw many things I have now forgotten. When I awoke, the room was spinning and bleary. I heard the deep, muffled voices. Then I saw what was next to me, and my heart froze. Yes, but he was not as you know him now. At least, he did not appear that way to me. Anyway... What I saw was the king of dragonflies, the largest dragonfly imaginable. He was in a massive jar to my left, and he was spinning about in a frenzy. That is when I realized I was in a jar of my own. I tried to call out for help, but no words came. I looked down at my hands and saw that they were missing. I now seemed to have pincers. I leapt to my feet in horror and bounced off the inside of the jar. Suddenly, I realized I was flying. I know, it was not a happy moment. I tried to look for a bright side and found one. At least I was not a chicken. I buzzed about for a bit, trying to get used to my new wings. After a while, I had things under control. I realized that the handsome dragonfly in the jar next to mine was not so large after all. I had been made small, like him. I also saw that we were not alone. A number of other jars were in a row to my left, each holding an insect. There were butterflies and glow bugs and moths too. My vision was blurred by the jar, but I could still make out four enormous figures at the far end of the now seemingly cavernous room. One of them pointed in my direction and laughed. The sound was booming and very scary. The individual approached and I saw it was Mother. I heard a noise from my right, looked over, and saw that my dragonfly neighbor had fallen down dead with fright. Mother came right up to my jar and tapped an enormous grubby finger against the glass. Her toothless grin filled my view. She then picked up the dragonfly's jar shook it, scowled, and slammed it back down. She grabbed another jar, this time from my left, removed the lid and plucked out the moth inside. It feebly flapped between her fingers. She held it up to my jar, then forced the poor creature into her mouth. I heard the body crunch between her gums. That is when I heard a voice inside my head. It was well-spoken and calm. It was the voice of a scholar giving a lesson to a dim child. It said, pay attention. Go still and she will not eat you. Mother swallowed the moth and picked up my jar again. I let myself go limp and lay motionless. I seemed to be missing my eyelids, so I was forced to watch as she first uncapped my jar, then reached inside. Her gigantic hand paused before it reached me, then withdrew. Stay still, said the voice in my head. It was hard, but I managed. Mother held my jar up and studied me. She shook me, then studied me again. Passed out, she said with a voice like an avalanche. 
scared him senseless. She put my jar down and turned away. You'll have to get me more. I need to eat tonight. Another huge figure came into view. It was the eldest brother. Mother, he said, why do you have to frighten them so? Because they taste better squirming and fearful. You know that. Her son sighed, woke his brothers, and left. Mother turned and made for her bed. That is when I heard the dragonfly yell in my head. Your jar! Hit the wall of your jar! Mother had placed me on the shelf with the base of my jar hanging over the edge. I leapt towards the glass, flapping my wings as fast as I could. I bounced back, then hit it again and again. My jar toppled off the shelf and smashed on the stone floor. Yes, cried the dragonfly. Lay still. She's coming back. So there I lay, surrounded by shattered glass, as mother approached us a second time. I thought she was going to step on me, but instead she cursed and knelt down. I heard her joints creak. I'll have to get you a new jar. Or I could just eat you now. Not tasty, but tempting. I wanted to flap my wings. I wanted to fly and hide, but I did not. She picked me up. Her grimy face filled my view. She smiled and licked her lips. She opened her mouth. As her mouth drew nearer, I started to flap my wings. I could not help it. I wanted to escape. Alas, she was too strong and I was too small. Suddenly, there was a bonk noise and Mother's jaw went slack. Her muddy eyes rolled back and she collapsed. I struggled out from under her hand and saw the dragonfly's jar rolling to a stop near a chair leg. You knocked her out, I yelled in my mind. Yes, he replied. I managed to tip my jar onto her head. Thank you, I said. What is your name? He said, I cannot remember. I have been a dragonfly too long, but there is hope for you. He directed me to a nearby alchemy table and told me to nibble a bit of this and that. He had the antidote memorized. I followed his instructions and soon I felt the worst pins and needles I have ever endured. I passed out, and when I awoke, I was me again. I rushed over to the dragonfly and opened his jar, but he refused to fly out. I heard his voice in my head, but it was weaker, distant somehow. It is too late for me, he said. The antidote cannot fix me. I am more dragonfly than man now. Please, reseal my jar. It brings me comfort. Mr. Dragonfly later told me that he had seen Mother turn her sons into insects as punishment for not doing chores and so on. She was scary. Anyway, I did as I was asked, then placed him on a chair while I retrieved my clothes. I then went to the long table where I had eaten. The soup, said the insect I would later come to think of as Mr. Dragonfly. I turned and smiled at him. We were having the same idea. I carried the soup pot to where Mother lay, opened her mouth and splashed some inside. It will take time. Free the others and leave, said Mr. Dragonfly. Why can I only hear you inside my head, I ask? He told me that the other insects had been there far longer than him, and they had forgotten how to communicate with words long ago. I listened closely to a nearby butterfly. I could hear a faint weeping inside my head, nothing more. Not just bugs, other animals too. Usually I do not hear very much that is understandable, but sometimes I get lucky. Mr. Dragonfly is the most eloquent by far. Anyway, I opened all the jars, then turned to leave, and saw a fat moth with grey wings lumbering out of a pile of dirty clothes where Mother had been. 
I scooped her up, sealed her in a jar, then hid her at the back of an ingredients cupboard. I could hear her hissing at me in my mind. I turned to Mr. Dragonfly. Do you want to come with me? I asked. Yes, please, he replied. Let us go. I grabbed his jar, unlocked the door and opened it. I found myself face to face with the brothers. Yes, their mouths fell open, their eyebrows went up, and the youngest let out a little whimper. I drew my sword and ran at them. They were so surprised to see me, it took a moment for them to realize I was going for the exit, not them. They shrank back as I rushed past, and soon I had reached the hidden door that led out to the city. I pulled a rusty wall chain, and the opening appeared. But before I could get outside, the eldest brother jumped on my back and tore open my scars. I shook him off, making sure not to drop Mr. Dragonfly, then stumbled out into Windhelm. I lost my footing and went to the ground. Roll, cried Mr. Dragonfly inside my mind. I did, and a mace came down, smashing a flagstone next to my head. The brothers had followed me outside. They each had a weapon, and it was clear they wanted me dead. I regained my feet and brandished my sword at them. Back, I yelled. I will let you live if you walk away. Mother wouldn't turn you back, said the middle brother. What did you do to her? I cured her of her ugliness and put her somewhere safe, I replied. Townsfolk stopped to see what was happening. We were attracting a crowd. I turned to the onlookers and said, These men held me against my will. Call the guard. My words were met with stony avidity. Then someone threw a bottle at me. The eldest brother shouted, This filthy Khajiit broke into our home. He was looking for skooma money, no doubt. The crowd was getting nasty, and as another bottle smashed near my feet, I saw two guards at the back of the group turn and walk away. Run, said Mr. Dragonfly inside my head. He did not have to tell me twice. Yes, it is like an ugly icy cage, where the downtrodden and oppressed must bump shoulders with the apathetic and small-minded. The youngest brother took a swipe at me with his sword. I leapt back, overturned the cart of cabbages, and fled. I sped past the graveyard into the marketplace and glanced behind me. I had lost most of the crowd, but the brothers were still on my tail. I rushed through the main gate, out onto the bridge. I was exhausted, but while my legs had been running, Mr. Dragonfly's mind had come up with a plan. As the brother stepped out of the gate, panting and furious, I walked out onto the ledge to the left before the first stone arch. I sheathed my sword and held out Mr. Dragonfly's jar. Do you know who this is? I shouted. I don't care, all those bugs look the same to me, replied the middle brother. Stay there, you coward. You're a dead man. I waited until all three brothers stood near me at the edge. Do you love your mother? I asked. Yes, sniffed the youngest. Tell us where she is and we'll kill you quickly, said the eldest. Here, I replied. Then I threw Mr. Dragonfly off the bridge. Yes, I am very proud of him. I think he may have used up the last of his courage in that moment, though. The brothers all yelled, No! and threw themselves over the edge, trying in vain to catch the jar. If I had carried out the plan 30 feet along the wall, they may have survived. But the icy water they landed in was very shallow. There was quite a mess. For a second, I was worried about Mr. Dragonfly. But then I spotted his jar bobbing in the bloody water. I made my way down to the river and retrieved him. He thanked me, and I asked him again if he wouldn't rather be released. No, he said. I will stay in my jar and in your company if that is okay. I have already forgotten my past life, and even the meanings of these words I am saying are beginning to fade. I told him he could stay with me for as long as he wished, then asked what I should call him. Mother scratched my initials on the lid of my jar, he said. 
I no longer know what they mean. They seem to say Mr. D, I replied. Do you mind if I call you Mr. Dragonfly? He said that was fine. He then said that I would no doubt lose the ability to hear him soon, but so far that has not been the case. Ever since my transformation, I have been able to randomly pick up his thoughts. I can also sometimes understand horses, fleas, and dogs too. Their thoughts are alien and often do not contain words as we know them, but I can usually decipher the overall gist. Mr. Dragonfly's fear about losing his words has also not come to pass. I think our little conversations are good for his mind. Anyway, that is how Mr. Dragonfly and I met. It was a long story. I hope I did not bore you. I am glad you enjoyed it. Telling it was easier than living it, my friend. It is quite a story. Are you sitting comfortably? It happened about a week after the Japan job and my betrayal. After the Dopan deal went sour, I managed to score a little skooma on the road. I used it and sat up all night staring at the stars. I decided I would end my life the next day. I thought it best for everybody if I just went away. You are very nice to say such things. I am glad too. I watched the sun come up then made a noose. My camp was high near the edge of a cliff. I fastened the noose to an overhanging tree branch. I used the last of my skooma, placed the rope around my neck, and jumped off. It was not bravery, my friend. If anything, it was cowardice. At the time, though, it felt like the least painful option for everybody. I was wrong. I remember falling, the twanging noise as the rope went taut, a brief moment of pain, a snapping noise, I thought it was my neck. Then I was falling again, the cliffs rushed past me, I thought, well, the rope didn't work, but the ground will do the trick. A wide ledge hurried up to meet me. I closed my eyes just before the impact. There was a smashing noise. Then I was underwater. I thought, well, the ground didn't kill me, but drowning should end my sorry life. The gods had other plans, though. A current dragged me to the surface, coughing and spluttering. That's when I heard them. I heard clucking. I was in a river being swept through a large cavern. It was dark, but I could make out many cages on the bank. Chickens strutted about outside the cages. I could smell magic. I gathered my strength and hauled myself out of the water. Inside the cages, people were bound and gagged. Ignoring the chickens, I rushed over and tried to open the first cage I came to. It was locked tight. Suddenly, I felt a pain in my foot. A chicken was pecking at me. I kicked it away, but it came back with reinforcements. I was in a flapping, pecking nightmare. I tried to get back in the water, but before I had gone a few steps, I was knocked unconscious. I awoke tied to a chair. There was a foul-smelling man studying me. I could hear the river nearby, but now I was in a crypt of some sort. Chickens and rabbits watched me from behind the smelly man. He said he was going to make me useful. I did not like the sound of that. My options were limited. I had no weapons, but I did have a little time. This fellow liked to talk. I unsheathed my claws and went to work on the ropes that held me to the chair. The man seemed to have a bit to say, so I let him talk. He said he was a powerful wizard, and that he had learned how to transform people into animals. 
Once transformed, he said I would want nothing but to aid him. He said he had a spy network of chickens and rabbits all over Skyrim. Yes, that is what I thought. I asked why only chickens and rabbits. He replied that once I was a chicken, no one would ever take notice of me again. A bear or a mammoth would be too conspicuous. Smaller animals make the best spies. I told him if he turned me into a chicken, I'd peck his eyes out. He told me that the change was not only physical. I would want to do his bidding, nothing else. He said he was using the information his spy network gathered to cause hate across the land. He fed on hate. It made him stronger. I had spied a wooden door in one wall that smelled rotten. As soon as I felt the rope around me give a little, I jumped at the door. It burst open as I hit it, and the chair broke apart. I was free. The wizard screamed in anger and loosed a spell in my direction. I dodged his attack and ran down a long stone tunnel. I heard the smelly wizard begin to laugh. There is only death that way, he yelled. Good, I replied. I've been seeking that all day. Yes, the smell of bones and dust filled my nose. The wizard did not follow me. I ran for what seemed like forever. Eventually, I came to a vast chamber with a spindly spiral staircase leading up in the center. The floor was littered with dried out bodies. They had been dead for hundreds of years, but as it turned out, they were still quite feisty. As I made for the staircase, the dead started to groan and move. I jumped over them and began to climb the steps. There were too many Draugr to fight, so I concentrated on climbing. Halfway up, I spotted an opening in the ceiling. The air was fresher up there. That is when I uncharacteristically tripped. I tumbled back down the stairs. Soon, the dead reached me. They clawed at me. They held me down. Dry, cracked fingers tore my face to ribbons, giving me these scars. I almost gave up, and then something amazing happened. I realized I wanted to live. I realized that my life was still worth something. I realized that I could be the person my brother knew again. This realization gave me a strength I never knew I had. I fought back, shouting, NO! Again and again. No, you will not have my life. No, this is not where I die. No. I struggled to my feet, fighting all the while. I snapped necks. I broke arms. I gouged out eyes. Somehow, I made it back to the staircase. Yes, it was pretty amazing. If I had not spent all that morning almost dying, I wonder if I'd be here talking to you now. Anyway, I reached the top of the stairs, forced open the hatch above, and stepped out into daylight. I was only a few hundred feet from my camp. I stared at the tree with the snapped rope hanging from it for a long time. I knew I owed much, and swore that I would repay any debt I could. Later, when I realized my friend could still be alive, I decided that if I had to die, it should be by their hand. You know the rest. That is how I got these scars. It is a good tale, yes? Yes, it is. Living it made me the man you see before you. Scars and all. You are generous, but I have a little of my own tucked away. I do not need yours. The same place I keep my bread and writing materials. I will look after any money you want me to carry, but I will not spend it. I would rather pay my own way. A little. I do not need much. I was wondering, though. 
While we are adventuring together, would you mind if I did some looting of my own? Nothing big, but perhaps if I see a gem stuck in a crack in the ground or a few gold pieces you have missed, I could keep what I find. What you say? Thank you. Now the possibility of a future exists, maybe I should start planning for it. Anyway, did you want to talk about something else? I am a little tired, but other than that, all is well. How is everything with you? Good. Let us talk of other things. You want a performance review? Okay. Okay. I will list some of your attributes. Here we go. You smell worse than usual today. You are very rich. Spiders make you uneasy. I understand, they are not for everyone. All the more for me. You have never done time in a cell. Unlike me. You have become quite the wanderer. You are beginning to know Skyrim like the back of your hand. You own some choice property. You have more than one place to hang your hat. Eh, uh, let me think. If you insist on fighting with magic, may I suggest more practice? I do not want to be unconscientiously scorched. You are healthy. Try to stay that way. You have been known to influence people's decisions with a mix of body language and craftiness. You are strong, free, and single. You can hold your own with a one-handed weapon. There is always more to be learned, though. In life, you tend to go your own way. You do not follow the herd. You have great fashion sense. You do not have much of a temper. You are rational and diplomatic. You use two-handed weapons from time to time, but they slow you down. With practice, I think you could remedy that. You are not into politics. More often than not, you are polite and sincere. You grow more sneaky every day. Keep at it. Being heard is often the difference between life and death in our line of work. You enjoy a book from time to time. Reading has increased your knowledge. You do not believe in wasting energy. You do what you must, then move on. You have been practicing with your bow. You show promise. Now, how do I conclude? You are proving good for Skyrim. There are still many matters that need your attention, but there is no denying, you are pretty fantastic. I say it as I see it. Let me know if you want another progress report. It is fun judging people. All things considered, I am doing well. How is everything with you? Good. Let us talk of other things. You have my full attention. Yes, thank you. I will try to be a good guest. <laughs>